am very pleased to introduce to you today Peter Becky, who is here for welcoming him to Hillsdale's campus. Um, he is a professor of economics and philosophy at George Mason University. He is also the director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center. He is co-editor of the Review of Austrian Economics and author of Living Economics, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, which he'll be talking about today. Dr. Becky has also co-authored, authored, and edited many other books um, on economics. Before joining the faculty at George Mason University in 1998, Becky taught at New York University. In addition, Becky was a national fellow at the Hoover Institution for War, Revolution, and Peace at Standard University and the F.A. Hayek Fellow in 2004 and 2006 at the London School of Economics. Additionally, he has been a visiting professor or scholar at the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow, the Max Planck Institute for Research into Economic Systems in Gina, Gina Germany, Gina, Gina. something like that, yeah. The Stockholm School of Economics, <coughs> Central European University in Prague, and the Charles University in Prague. In March 2011, but he was a Fulbright Fellow at the University of Economics in Prague, Czech Republic. Dr. Becky has also received numerous academic awards as well as honorary doctorates from several scholarly institutions. And as you can tell, I can go on and on talking about all of his accomplishments. So if you'd like to find out more, you can visit his website, which is www.peter-becky.com for more information. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Becky. Well, it's a real thrill to be here at Hillsdale College, Freedoms College, and uh, to uh, uh, get a chance to talk to you about my book, Living Economics, um, which is, uh, there's a little story behind that, which I'll explain in a second. Um, but I want you, as we go through this whole thing, to look at the image on the, the uh, cover, or, and also the title, because I'm going to sort of try to work the theme of my talk through that idea of these things. So, the story behind this book is very simple. In 2010, I, along with my colleague Chris Coyne, were hired by the University of Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala to go down there and to oversee all of their programs and then to write up recommendations about how they can continue their tradition. Now, University of Francisco Marroquin is a really fascinating story if you don't know about it. It was founded by a man named Manuel Ayao. Emmanuel Ayal was trained as a mechanical engineer um, in Canada and in the United States. And he's from Guatemala, but he came to North America to be trained, went back home to Guatemala, and wanted to have a career as a mechanical engineer. But nobody was building anything. So if you're not building, there's no need for mechanical engineers. And so. Uh, Manuel Lyle was confused. You know, why is it that there aren't any opportunities for building? In Canada, in the United States, they're building all the time. Why isn't there, you know, this kind of uh, building activity going on in Guatemala? And that led him on a long uh, self-taught tour of economics to try to figure out why is it that some nations are rich and vibrant and other nations are poor and stagnating. <coughs> and he came upon the idea that it had to do with the division of labor and the extensiveness of the division of labor. The greatest uh, cause of the wealth of nations is an extensive division of labor, the ability to engage in exchange and specialization. And the reason why uh, other countries stagnate is because they thwart that division of labor. Um, Another way to think about it is, is that the societies that are vibrant are contract-oriented societies, whereas the societies that stagnate are connection-based societies. You're only as well off as the connections that you know, rather than the, what you can produce and what you can provide for others as services in the market. And so Manuel Al started out by having a think tank in economics. Um, and where they would study economic issues. And then that evolved very quickly into a university, the University of Francisco Marroquin, uh, which they founded, him and another group of businessmen that had similar concerns. And they decided to be a kind of a different type of university. And they have a law school there, they have a medical school there, they have a dentistry school there, they have a school of architecture. They also have, you know, your typical liberal arts college. They have a a, uh, uh, a sort of an, a small 
Socratic <coughs> College, to, um, and they name each of these things. They're very detailed-oriented people because they're businessmen as opposed to academics. Academics tend to get the big principles right, but then don't pay attention to details. These folks pay attention to all the details because they're business-oriented uh, you know, folks. And so, for example, their Socratic Dialogue College is called the uh, Michael Polanyi College. All right? Their auditorium is the Milton Friedman Auditorium. Their you know, building is the Mises Library, you know, these kind of things. They are the digital archive to Henry Hazlitt's uh, collected, uh, collected works and papers and their uh, Center for Teaching of Economics where they teach principles that can be called the Center Henry Hazlitt. They have a advanced lab in experimental economics, that's the Vernon Smith lab. Their Center on Entrepreneurship and Market Process Theory is the Israel M. Kersner, you know, Center for the Study of Entrepreneurship and the Market Process. And they have all these little details and, and very, you know, not, not just like Hillsdale College, by the way where Hillsdale has a reason why you have statues of various people and what they mean and everything like that. Everything that they do is geared towards having you do that. Well, so Chris and I were hired by University of Francisco American because they're going through a transition period right now. Unfortunately, their president at the time, uh, um, uh, Giancarlo, uh, is very ill. And so they're going through a period of a transition and how they're going to pull off this transition and yet keep the vision going for the next generation. So they don't want to be backward looking, they're an onward and upward kind of approach, but they want to do that and they asked us to come in. So we spent time down there and one of the things that we did was every day we, would, I met, we met with deans of every department, including the medical school, law school, dentistry, met with all these different people. And uh, every day we went from the econ department through the business school or the business school back to the econ department and it's a passageway. Again, it's, it's in Guatemala, which actually is kind of like the way the college is set. It's a beautiful landscape <coughs> and if you've ever got a chance, I highly recommend you to go there. Um, and so it's this sort of this bridge that goes through kind of almost like a rainforest. Well, a kid from New Jersey, it looks like a rainforest. Uh, like a rainforest kind of environment. Um, and they have a mural on the wall of all the great economists that have practiced economics. Now, in other parts of the thing, they have the great scholastics, uh, right, thinkers, and, you know, and then they, you know, have, uh, in other parts, they have a giant Ayn Rand thing, you know, as I said, they have the Milton Friedman statue, they have great quotes, all this kind of stuff. But in this one area, you start with uh, basically, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm spazzing right now on the name of uh, Richard Cantillon. Okay, they start with Richard Cantillon, and then they go through, you know, up through Adam Smith and David Hume, and you get to, you know, Say and Bastiat, and you get to Mill and, uh, you know, uh, Bentham and the various different, you know, Ricardo and then Marshall and Menger and, all, you know, Pareto and various different people all the way up, and it ends with, you know. Mises and Hayek and Buchanan and Armin Alchin and uh, Vernon Smith. So you go from basically Adam Smith to Vernon Smith on this mural and it takes, the, the way the wall goes is it goes like this and then it bends like this and then it ends up over here with this fantastic quote from Mises about the importance of economics. If you haven't done it yet, you know, there's no spoiler alert here, go to the very last paragraph of Human Action where Mises sort of sums up like what it's, why it matters, right? And what he says is basically, you can deny the teachings of economics, okay? But that doesn't annul economics, all right? So just like I could deny, oh, let me do, be a little bit safer, I don't want to splash you full of water, <laughs> right? I could deny the law of gravity, right? And I could come up with all kinds of theories about why that's not going to be true, but nevertheless, if I drop these keys, they fall. All right, and that's what Mises is basically saying. He says, you can deny the laws of economics, but you're not going to stop economic forces from working. What you do is you end up by denying the human race. You'll annul the human race. And so it's big game. Economics isn't like just like, hey, do you think it's kind of cool? It's like, again, like I said in my last talk, it's the golden key that unlocks the mystery to everything in the world. And, you know, the point of the economics teacher is to seduce you into wanting to own that key. 
right? And if you don't own that key, you're like, uh, like a blind squirrel reaching, trying to get nuts. You're not going to find much, all right? But if you own that key, you can unlock the mystery to everything in the world. And that's what, you know, uh, Mises is trying to get you to think about. And they have that quote at the end. So I'm walking by this thing every day, every day, and I'm like, it's kind of weird. Why did those guys get up on the wall, not another guy? So, you know, academics think like this, not normal people. Right, so you're walking along and you're like, you know, Philip Wicksteed's up there. That makes sense. He wrote The Common Sense of Political Economy in 1910. Most of you probably have no idea who I'm talking about, rightfully so, in some sense. But, you know, it's like, I can see why he's up there. But, like, how come, you know, some other guy, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, Davenport or, you know, Brown or one of these other guys that were, you know, good early neoclassical economists. You know, how come they're not up on the wall? You know, like, what's going on? What separated? So that started me thinking about what separates and what doesn't separate. And then I have another thing. So my entire career, I've heard people say, and I'm sure that you in here have heard this too, oh, that opinion of yours, that's not mainstream. Right? Now, I'm going to be kind of obnoxious, okay, so just bear with me, but like one of my teachers was Kenneth Boulding. He's the second John Bates Clark Award winner. That's the highest honor that anyone can earn under the age of 40 is in economist. Another one of my teachers won the Nobel Prize in economics, all right, James Buchanan. I work with ideas that are from another Nobel Prize winner, F.A. Hyatt. And I'm very good friends with two other Nobel Prize winners who actually use those ideas from Hayek and from these other people to develop their ideas, Vernon Smith and Doug North. So I never understood this comment, right? So Professor Steele might remember this, but it used to annoy me. I went from George Mason University to become a professor at NYU, and then I'd hear this stuff from the students, complaining about Ronald Coase or whoever, you know, like that, and it never made any sense to me. And I'm like, you know, or my colleagues, junior colleagues with me, and they would say like, oh, you know, you didn't study with Matry. I'm like, I studied with Gordon Tullock, Jim Buchanan, and Kenneth Bowling. Who'd you study with? <laughs> like, come on, like, let's get serious here. I studied with like Johnny Unitas, <laughs> Joe Montana, you know, and Bart Starr. And they studied with like, I don't know, squeaky, you know, whatever, right? <laughs> and somehow, because, you know, squeaky gets put squiggles up on a board, they're mainstream, and I'm not. So I'm like, this is BS. I am mainstream. Like, if, if, I, if I'm Adam Smith, and I come to 2005, and I look at economics, who's Adam Smith going to recognize as an economist? Me! <laughs> right? What he's going to do is look at my colleague and he's going to say, oh, you're a statistician or a mathematician. I don't understand what you're doing. <laughs> right? And so, and that's true also if, you know, David Ricardo showed up or, you know, any of these classical economists, David Hume or whoever, you know. And so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm tired of this. So why is this the case? By the way, two, another thing happened, which is, what the heck does mainstream mean? If mainstream means Paul Krugman, <laughs> but it also means Bob Lucas. What does that mean? Substantively, they're worlds apart. Much farther apart, right, than like I am from Adam Smith or, or John Baptiste Say or anything like that. There's a huge gap, but what they agree on, and so, you know, I've been struggling for like 20 years trying to figure out the sociology of all of this, which is, why is it that economics used to be about substantive propositions and could be conveyed in a variety of languages, right? So I could convey it in natural language, and in natural languages I could communicate it in English, French, Spanish, German, right? And in fact, the great economists that are up on that wall down at UFM all spoke in those different languages, and yet they had something that they were saying that was substantive, versus now a discipline which claims, oh, by the way, you could put it in mathematics too, all right? And people did it. So for example, in 1933, Ludwig von Mises says, the difference between the Marshallians, the Valrasians, and the Austrians is only one of language, not of substance, all right? So how does Mises square that position? Mises is making that argument. 
And so the question is, is, okay, so what makes you go up on the wall? What makes you not go up on the wall? Well, it's not that you're mainstream or not mainstream. So what I came up with is in this book, I, I pushed this language where I call mainline economics, which, by the way, is a phrase from Kenneth Boulding. Boulding was my teacher, and he used to refer to the main line of economics. What he meant by that is if I drew a line from Adam Smith all the way up to today, there would be economists that are on that line. And what makes them be on that line? And those, that, what makes them on that line is two propositions. They believe in the self-interest proposition, and they believe that within a certain set of institutional environment, self-interest, pursuit of self-interest will generate an invisible hand. So there's two, there's a, you know, a uh, self-interest postulate and an invisible hand theorem. And the way by which you get to it is through institutional analysis. Adam Smith did not say pursuing your own self-interest under any conceivable circumstance will generate a publicly desirable outcome. That's a caricature of what Adam Smith argued that is wrong. All you have to do is read the book. Adam Smith goes at great lengths, for example, to talk about the difference between, and I start the book by going over this, the difference between teachers in Oxford and teachers in, in Glassboro. Now, here's the difference. In Oxford, Ox, uh, Oxford, they were paid a set salary. In Glasgow, Glasgow what did I say, Glassboro before? Yeah, so, so Edinburgh and Glasgow together, right? It's Glasgow. Uh, so uh, in Scotland, let's save myself from the stupidity, and you got me on film. All right. Um, so uh, in Scotland, the teachers were paid by student fees. Smith asked the question, where do you expect teachers to be better teachers? Right? So this is how he describes the teacher in Oxford. Hello. Not teaching you today. I'm still getting paid. <laughs> now, here's the teacher in Edinburgh. It's all dynamic. What can you learn? How can I teach you? Why? <laughs> all right. It's a emphasis point. Uh, okay. uh, you know, right? Because the teacher requires you to be in the room in order for him to get paid. So that's the incentive that he's facing. Note in both cases, it's homo professionomicus. Right? So it's not that the professors all of a sudden in, in Scotland are like, oh, I really care about learning. Whereas if, if I'm in England, I'm like, I don't give a crap about learning. Right? You know, this is my virtue or anything like that. It's the incentive structure that does it. That's how an economist thinks. Now, here's another thing. Smith and Hume, close friends, had different views on religion. Religion's a big debate at the time that they lived, right? Public policy-wise. All right? Smith is a believer. Hume is a skeptic. Hume wanted national support for religion. Smith believed we should have a free market in religion. Why? Think like an economist, not like a bozo, right? So think like an economist now. So here's the deal. Hume doesn't want you to have religiosity. If the ministers are paid by the state, they don't have to be, think about your Oxford dons. They're paid without getting you to be excited to be in church. If you don't show up, they still get paid. So what kind of ministers are there? They're boring. They don't excite religious fervor among the population. Therefore, religion dies. And it's a small cost to let the state just pay for religion to die. <laughs> you wants religion to die. Smith, on the other hand, wants religiosity to actually rise in the society. So he wants to have a vibrant free market in religious education. Because why? Because the preachers are going to have to only be paid if you show up in the pews. So what are they going to do? They're going to be dynamic lecturers. They're going to get you all excited, provide services in your church, and all that stuff like that. Do you see how in both cases the analysis is identical, but the normative conclusions are different? That's economics. Self-interest postulate, invisible hand theorem, by way of institutional analysis. So if you read Charles Dickens, who hates economists, right, and you read Hard Times by Charles Dickens, don't... You can, it's also in the Christmas story, and he just hates economics, Dickens, right? In fact, Scrooge is modeled on Herbert Spencer, 
right? That's why the mutton chops are the way it looks and all that stuff like that, okay? So he hates economics. But if you read Hard Times, it's perfect because uh, Goddard, right, is the philosophy of fact, which is the utilitarians, which are the classical economists. And they are mean, bad people. Whereas the more romantic people are the ones who have all these good intentions for humanity and all these things like that. He despises the economists trying to work through the, the you know, self-interest postulate, institutional analysis, and the invisible hand. Okay? If you took a Martian, right, and went back, or that Martian called Charles Dickens, all right, and you took him to, to you know, 1776 and asked him, what does it mean to be an economist? He would have said, oh, they believe in self-interest. And that it doesn't matter what your motives are. What matters is you can have bad motives like self-interest, but yet you're going to generate this harmony of interest through your interactions. And then you fast forward him to 1850, and he's going to believe the same thing. And you fast forward him to 1950, who's he looking at as the economists that believe that same proposition? So my point here is that the mainline economics, this line from Adam Smith to Vernon Smith, stands for something. It's a substantive proposition. Mainstream economics is simply a sociological category that we apply to whatever is currently scientifically fashionable. All right? Now, here's the thing that I, that I think is important for you guys to understand about scientific fashion, which you don't normally get, which is that scientific fashion is defined from the top down. And the top is very, very well defined in economics. All right? Since World War II, there's basically been five schools that are the top five schools. Anything out of that, everyone agrees to those top five schools. Then anything out of that is like 20 schools claiming to be in the top 10, and then 50 schools claiming to be in the top 20. So the reality is that unless you go to the top five schools, you're not really in the club. You're like a wannabe club member, right? So if I go to University of Michigan, I'm a wannabe club member because I'm not really in the top five. I'm not even in the top 10 by most rankings, right? So it's not that big of a deal. Like, oh, I went to Ann Arbor, so cool, right? That's good for you, right? Okay, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, you know, I went to someplace else, right? Here's what matters. MIT, Harvard, Chicago, Stanford, Princeton. Yale, eh. Brown, eh, eh. NYU, eh, eh, eh. right? You know, it's good. It's great. I love the school. I taught there for a long time. I love the school. All right, but it's not. It's always wanting to be Harvard, Chicago, Princeton, Stanford, and MIT. That's it. That's who defines economics. That's who controls the journals, the top journals. That's who controls the top positions. I mean, think about you know where did. The Council of Economic Advisors people graduate from? Those five schools. Where are the editors of the top journals graduate from? Those top schools. Right? Where are the people who are teaching in those top schools graduate from? Those top schools. <laughs> okay? So that's what, that's what defines it. Now, sometimes those top five schools are dominated by mainline economics. Milton Friedman, George Stigler. Okay? University of Chicago. Ronald Coase. Okay? Other times, they're not. It's in fact the rejection of those three propositions which defines what's currently scientifically cool. Behavioral economics, market failure theory, right? Samuelson, Samuelson, Solo, Arrow. All of these people who were mainstream economists were not mainline economists. They in fact were critics of the mainline. Now, go back to my mural at UFM. They're not on the wall. Thomas Malthus, not on the wall. <laughs> right? What did Thomas Malthus? He, he argued that there could be a general glut. Market would produce a general glut. What did John Baptista say? Say back to him. Thomas, in Econ 101, when you were taking Professor Wolfham's class, what happened when, the, you know, you know, when there was an excess supply of a good? Oh, this thing called the price goes down, and then we clear the market, right? Ah, oh, what did you forget? Failure. You're not on the wall, right? So you don't end up on the wall. So what we have here is, is that do you believe in a rational choice postulate? Do you believe in institutional analysis? That is the institutional setting of private property, freedom of contract, all right? And you believe in the invisible hand theorem or whatever that comes out of that versus what is currently scientifically fashionable. So we flip the argument. 
It's not that I'm not mainstream, I'm mainline. Okay? So I never bash, never bashful. You should never be bashful for the economics that you've learned at Hillsdale College because the economics that you learned at Hillsdale College is more substantively correct than what your peers at other institutions are learning in their economics classes when they spend the entire time talking about externalities and not how it is that markets ameliorate externalities. All right, the point isn't to deny the existence of externalities, right? That's the Vulcan, you know, the, the sort of Jedi mind trick, Murray Rothbard's Jedi mind trick. You know, there are no externalities, right? Uh, right? The point is, you know, that's fine, you know, it's, it's okay, it's an argument, but, uh, but the real argument is like a Kosian argument. In the face of these, what we call externalities, there's an argument to be made. Terry Anderson's made it, Demsets has made it, to eliminate the word externalities from our definition in economics. And I think they make some very, very good points. So I'm not arguing against it. But the point about the Kosian, think about how cool Kosian argument is. In the, in the face of these extreme externalities, markets nevertheless are the best institution to ameliorate those externality situations. That's a much more robust argument than the denial that externalities ever exist. So you confront the difficulty of the problem and then show how the market is the solution. So the traditional debate in 20th century went Perfect markets, okay, sort of mild, neutral government. That was the, let's say, 1900. All right, then what happens is you develop the theory of market failure. So you have imperfect markets, perfect government. Then what you had was public choice, imperfect markets, imperfect government. Okay, or excuse me, yeah, yeah, it, you know, imperfect markets, imperfect government. Then what you have is a sort of entrepreneurial solution, which is that comes out of that, which is markets fail, use the market to fix the failure. That's the kind of cosine an idea. So you want to see how robust these institutions are, that requires that you focus on this institutional. Does this have a laser? Yeah. yeah. So this is what's really cool, and this is where a lot of people that are trained in Austrian economics get tripped up, because they somehow forget that in Mises' position, their a priori propositions of economics, which deal with the rational choice postulate, okay, are, are then so, are fit, mixed with subsidiary empirical assumptions about the nature of property rights, about the sort of uh, the, the nature actually of the labor, you know, all these kind of different institutions, and that our analysis is, um, the best example of this actually, uh, I think, for you, learning is not actually presented in an Austrian technical book, it's actually in Robert Nozick's Anarchy, State, and Utopia political philosophy book. In the beginning part of the book, he has a, a section on invisible hand explanations. And the way he explains it is that you have rational choice, then you have filters, and then you have equilibrating tendencies. And that, the, that, that rational choice is sort of omnipresent, right? But the manifestation of rationality is context dependent on the filters. So Michael has probably heard this too many times in his life, but I always like to think about sporting analogies. So homo basketballicus, right? Man as a basketball player wants to score more points than his opponent at the least amount of effort. The way in which you go about and bring that actually into action is going to be a function of the way in which the rules of the game are structured. So at one time they had a jump ball after every basket. The game looked different than it looks today. At another time, like when I played, you didn't have a three-point line, right? The game was played differently than it is today, right? At one time, the lane, by the way, was really narrow, right? And then the Olympic rules, you guys ever watch the Olympics, the, name, the lane's much wider because they tried to change the rules of the game to change the strategies that they would play. At that time, in international competition, the United States had seven footers, the rest of the world had five footers, <laughs> right? And so they didn't want to give a, di a disproportionate advantage to like the Will Chamberlains of the world, so they tried to widen the lane because, right, because a five-footer can't really cover, you know, that, so they tried to push them farther away from the basket. The world's changed some, so, the, you know, things are changing. So the way in which basketball is actually played is a function of the rules of the game, while the players are still trying to do the best that they can for the least amount of effort. So you see what's universal and what's particular, okay? That's the institutional analysis and the, and the oh, uh, what did I do? I just passed. Okay. All right, forget it. <laughs> All right, so who's on the wall? Who's not on the wall? So here it is. Adam Smith, the Vernon Smith, what unites them? They understand the invisible hand. 
Simple as that. The self-regulating properties of the market economy, left to its own devices, ameliorates social conflict and realizes the social gains from cooperation. No Malthus, no Marx, no Keynes, no Krugman. What disqualifies them? Their work denies the invisible hand. Keynes is the classic in this because he denies the rationality postulate, right? Workers are irrational. And he denies the invisible hand by way of denying that the price system actually can operate. Right? That's the, that's the way the system works. If, if you have irrational people, but price system is not allowed to then guide them and discipline them, right? So how does the market actually work? Property, prices, and profit and loss. But if I deny that individuals respond rationally to incentives, it doesn't matter what kind of in institutional environment they're in. If I deny that prices are connected at all with their decisions, and they don't learn from profit and loss discipline, then of course I've eliminated the very mechanism by which they would get the self-interest self into the invisible hand. Note that it's not collapsing one to the other. It's deriving one from the other, not collapsing it. In, in, in standard modeling, we collapse them. We make the invisible hand postulate identical to the self-interest postulate. All right? In a utility maximizing Lagrangian, when you draw it, you draw it as an indifference curve in which you have the price of X and the price of all other goods. What does that give you? It gives you all the other relative prices in the economy. And you collapse that to a point on the production possibility frontier where you tangently kiss. So technically, what we've done is we've collapsed the one into the other. This is the institutionally antiseptic theory in Samuelson's economics. And as a result, if I can show that people are not rational, then we're not going to be able to derive the other one. So understand why it is behavioral economics is so important within the current mainstream of economics of overturning 100 years of economics. But it's wrong, right? Because the point about the market and the institutional analysis is that even with zero intelligence traders, as long as you have the institutions of property prices and profit and loss, what happens is you weed out. And even if people are going to make dumb decisions, the dumb decision makers are the ones that are weeded out of the market. And then the smart ones are weeded in. So this is, again, why, you know, so we look at the institutional filter as the mechanism by which you go from self-interest postulate to the invisible hand theorem. Okay? If you don't believe that, you have a hard time doing what would be called economics. You may find yourself teaching in an economics department. Okay? You may, in fact, even publish a lot in economic journals. You might write books that get categorized as economics, but you're not doing <coughs> economics. Understand the radicalness of the claim that I'm making. It's not meant to be soft peddling. Okay? Milton Friedman said there's only good economics and bad economics. That is right. There's no hyphenated economics. Good economics. But good economics is defined by individuals who understand the self-interested postulate, the invisible hand theorem, and the way I go from the self-interested postulate to the invisible hand through way of institutional analysis which mainly means mainline economics, all right? By the way, what else is going on here since self-interest is at the core? Well, here's the thing. All of macroeconomics, highly dubious, <laughs> right? Because it's not grounded in individual choice. So I always love the Roger Garrison line. I don't know how many of you know Roger Garrison, but I learned a lot of things when I was your age and a little older from Roger Garrison who uh, had a big influence on me, Roger, uh, first on this point, he said, look, there may be macroeconomic phenomena, inflation, unemployment, growth rates, things like that, but there's only microeconomic explanations and solutions. So unless you tra uh, trace it back to the choices of individuals, you're just not actually dealing with the problem, okay? The other thing that Garrison told me which around when I was your age, which is a very important for those of you contemplating graduate school, is the following. This has nothing to do with my talk. It's just, I'm just throwing it in there. Garrison said the following. He said, look, the problem with all of you guys is that you think that your life is going to be incomplete unless you get a PhD. He said, this is wrong on two fronts. First, many people can live very nice lives 
without getting a PhD. So you don't have to go get a PhD. Second of all, once you get a PhD, not all of life's problems go away. They only just start. So he said, don't go into this with some kind of romantic vision that, oh my God, you know, God gave me a mandate to get a PhD, and once I get the mandate, I have manna from heaven falling upon me. That's not how your life is gonna go. If you're going in that way, you're in the wrong business or whatever, right? So you only wanna go in if you can't help but go get a PhD, right? That is like, you're the type of person that sits at a pool and you wanna read like economics books. You're at a party and you know, people wanna to talk to you and you're like, the, the party talk that you really like is about the man curve sloping downward. Like that to you is the sexiest thing in the world. Like, you know, I'll date myself if I name, you know, some supermodel, but you know, she comes in the room and you're like, nah, supply and demand, more beautiful, right? That's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. All right, so, so now let me explain the book a little bit to you with that background in mind. The UFN mural, which you can find on YouTube, and I highly recommend that you look at that. Um, and also the, um, actually, just a step, didn't John Carlo get a, an honorary doctorate or something from here? The president of UFM? Who, 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 who knew that? Right, he did, right? Uh, fantastically courageous man, uh, the classical liberal uh, world owes him a lot for what he's done. Manuel Ayao was phenomenal, and, and, and Giancarlo took over that institution and really just moved it to a whole new level, and now we're hoping that Gabrielle, who's the new president, will continue in that tradition. But, but I, I highly recommend that you guys go. Reason has a wonderful magazine, uh, magazine article on how UFM led the move on telecommunications down in Guatemala and Latin America. Uh, so it's, it's just a really inspiring story. But you can also see the... The, the mural, and I recommend that you look at that. All right, so now let's go to the, the book. Again, keep in mind, I won't drop the next ones. Um, and, and, you know, I don't have the, the authority to say you get a discount for the ones that fell. But, um, so living economics and this tree. Okay, keep that in mind. There's a reason why people pick things. Okay, so the first thing is, is that notice that the tree is a healthy tree. And it's growing, and it's deep, you know, it's rooted, and all that stuff. Okay, and the idea here, and the title is "Living Economics: Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow." So uh, the idea is that economics is constantly evolving and constantly developing. And this quote is inspiring to me from Mises. All right, Mises, I consider the greatest economist that ever practiced mainline economics. And in Human Action, in the beginning of the book, page seven, six or seven, I think it is. He puts out this line where he's taking on the critics of economics. He says, look, to recognize that economics has errors in it as it's currently practiced, it's just simply to recognize that it's a human institution. But that means that it's, going to, it's a living body of thought. Economics is not a catechism. So one of the big things that I wanted to try to get across is that economics is an invitation to inquiry. Remember my key, right? You know, if I, if I have this golden key that unlocks the universe, I want to invite you to that inquiry. It's an intellectual seduction, okay? And that your teachers should be seducing you, you should be seducing yourself. That might sound a little weird. Uh, <laughs> but, you, you know, you should be getting yourself, you should be staying up at night, you know, reading these things and getting totally excited about the argument that's involved, okay? Economics is this amazing body of thought that has long history in Western civilization, and the best of Western civilization has to teach uh, in that. Um, so it merely means that economics is a living thing, and, li and to live implies both imperfection and change. Here's the deal. You young kids, there's tons of work for you to do. Economics isn't over. It's not like you sit there and take human action and then like say that he's my like leftist friend that I see him, he's arguing for $100 an hour minimum wage, and I take human action and I go, boom! <laughs> Read this, you idiot. That's not, that's not what economics is about, right? Economics is about inquiring, inquiry, curiosity, uh, engagement with a set of intellectual ideas. All right, so it's a living body of thought. While constantly evolving, though, it's not like it's brand new. Look at the tree. In order for the tree to be healthy, it has to be deeply rooted. Okay? What happens when there's lots of rain in an area 
and trees start to topple over. It's because their roots are not deep enough to hold it against the, the, the softening soil, right? So economics has roots that go all the way back to, you know, Aristotle, right? Aristotle, in debate with Plato, was the first person to highlight the incentive effects of private property rights. He's part of the main line of economics, right? That's how you have to understand the history of Western civilization is tied to mainline economics. Mainstream economics or non-mainline economics is actually not part of that tradition. It's part of the counter tradition, okay? So deeply rooted. This is a quote from Lord Acton. How many here know Lord Acton? Come on, you're at Hillsdale. You're classically educated. You all should know. Come on, Red, you know, right? There, you know? No, you know? Okay, so Lord Acton, how about this? I bet you you know this. Hold on, look at me. All right, I bet you you know this. Power, uh, uh, power tends to corrupt absolute. Power tends to corrupt absolutely. You ever heard that? That's Lord Acton. So you did know it. Okay. <laughs> so Lord Acton was a very big deal at the time. All right. Well, if you say things like that, people like to, you know, we're remembering it a hundred and some years later. You must be a big deal when you said it. We're not going to remember Lady Gaga, you know, line. She's not going to have the equivalent of that, you know, so we're not going to be around quoting, you know, applause or whatever, right? Um, so, or let's dance. Um, but um, <laughs> we quote Lord Acton. Well, uh, Lady Gladstone wants to know what's going on in politics at the time. And she writes to Lord Acton and she says, similar to like a year ago when we had our presidential debate. You know, imagine someone writing to a very famous you know, person and saying, hey, who should I vote for, Obama or Romney? I'm unclear, what's going on? You know, is that what's going on? Should I be all behind the Tea Party or should I not? You know, these kind of things. And Lord Acton responds back to her and he says, look, Politics, this is a message, by the way, most of you are, some of you are going to be surprised about, but I think it's an important one to hear. Politics is not where the action is at. That's just transitory. That's not for serious people. Politics. Serious people focus on ideas. And what he's saying here is not the popular movement, but the traveling of the minds of the men who sit in the seat of Adam Smith that is really serious and worthy of all attention. Lord Acton is saying, don't follow those debates, pick up Adam Smith. Don't follow those debates, read the treatise, uh, you know, political economy, John Baptista say, understand the underlying dynamics of society rather than the political machinations that fascinate so many of us, okay? And this is again, you know, sort of a big part of understanding the meaning of the thing. This is where the action is. The worldly philosophers embrace the teachings of the worldly philosophers and try to grapple with their ideas. And how cool is that? <coughs> and then finally, again, the stakes are huge. Not like, oh, you know, I disagree. I kind of like Adam Smith, but you know, Karl Marx has a good point or whatever. It's not just a trivial little discussion. It's about the lives and, and, and well-being of millions, billions of people. All right, this is Bob Lucas. Great paper, The Mechanics of Economic Development. And he simply points out to us, he says, look, is there some action a government of India could take that would lead the Indian economy to grow like the Indonesia's or Egypt's? If so, what? If not, what is it about the nature of India that makes it so? The consequences for human welfare involved in these questions like these are simply staggering. Okay, why are some nations rich and other nations, you know, sorry. Why are some nations rich and other nations poor? How is it that nations that are poor, New Zealand in the 1970s, become rich, New Zealand in the 1990s? And how is it that countries that are rich, Argentina at the turn of the, of the 20th century, become poor, Argentina in the middle of the 20th century? How did that happen, okay? What's the title of Adam Smith's great book? Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. You have the full title? Nature and causes. All right, so we got, I got red over here, I got gray down here. Gray is awesome because I want to point out, red's awesome too, all right? But uh, she, she knew Lord Acton. Anyway. But gray here, look, look what he said, right? Note what he got. First line, an inquiry. What did I say in my first thing? An invitation to inquiry. 
It's not a settled catechism. It's an inquiry. Curiosity. Let your curiosity guide you. Okay? Curiosity might kill a cat, but it fuels a scholar. Be a scholar. Okay? An inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. What are those? The nature? What's well-being? What's happiness? All this stuff. What are the causes? Property, prices, profit, and loss which enables us to realize the social gains from cooperation on the division of labor. That's why nations are rich. They realize the gains from trade and the gains from innovation. Why are nations poor? Because they curtail those gains from trade and those gains from innovation, mainly through a lot of government stupidity. Okay, so Lucas is doing it. So the tree represents these branches or all the new fields in economics, all the new excitement, the growth and intellectual development. The roots, the history of thought is in the deep roots that that tree exists in, okay? But the flourishing of that tree, the replenishing of that tree, right, is constantly fueled by the curiosity of the individuals. Once you realize the stakes are involved, you can't think about anything else, okay? Once you understand the golden key that unlocks the universe, you do things like that drive your family nuts, like for example, Mary Poppins. Isn't Mary Poppins about, you know, moms and dads coming to recognize that they need to be with their kids and give, no, 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 it's about the instability of fractional reserve banking, <laughs> right? That's what leads to the crisis at the end, you know? You, you, you know, you start seeing the economics in everything. And, and, and that is really, really a cool thing. It's not a perversion. It's actually, you know, one of the coolest things in the world. So push it to the end. Degree. What did I say there? Economics is not a 24, is not a 9 to 5 occupation. It's a 24 7, right? It's a set of eyeglasses on which you see everything in the world through it. All right, so what do I do in the book? So I, the way I structure the book is as follows. The first part of the book is what are the core principles of economics and the economic way of thinking? What, are the, what is enduring and what is fleeting in, modern, in, in economics through time? And so I go through the whole argument about opportunity cost reasoning. Uh, sorry, what I said before, this whole point about uh, individual choice, the institutional analysis, development, and the invisible hand. I try to establish that as the core enduring proposition of economics from Adam Smith to Vernon Smith. Then the second part of the book is devoted to intellectual biographies of a sort that relate to various great <laughs> economists that either are on that wall or you know, were students of people on that wall or whatnot that, uh, that I've had you know, personal influence with or influence on me. Um, and then the third part is, if we believed what they had to say, how would that change our practice of economics? And what I suggest in there is that it shifts the practice of economics to a much more humble position. We have humility. Now, let me just give you two quick examples. Professor Wolfham will relate to this because the first one is from a debate between Jim Buchanan and Richard Musgrave. And it's called Public Finance versus Public Choice. And there's a book. And what they did was they were invited to give a series of lectures where one commented on the other. So Musgrave would give a lecture on public finance, and Buchanan would comment. Buchanan would give a lecture on public choice, and then Musgrave would comment. In the middle of the conversation with Musgrave, Buchanan interrupted, which is very unlike his character. He interrupted me. He said, now I get it. He goes, no Chicago economist would ever say what you just said. Because no Chicago economist would ever presume that they were a benevolent despot that could like, set the stable social welfare function and set the you know, tax, or tax rates and such like that. They don't conceive of the economist as an engineer. They conceive of the economist as a scientist, okay? which is a different <coughs> kind of position. Gregory Menke, a less sort of ideologically aligned choice, has a wonderful essay in the Journal of Economic Perspectives in which he con contrasts the economist as scientist, which he equates with the Chicago School, and the economist as engineer, which he equates with the Harvard-MIT cabal. Now, here's the thing that's very important. That article was written before the financial crisis, and one of the things that he pointed out was that no economist of the economic science perspective ever went to Washington. The people in charge were always the MIT Harvard types. Now, what does that mean? It means the narrative that's been attempted to be constructed in your lifetime is the wrong narrative. We never had a non-Keynesian period. 
We won, won an intellectual victory, but in implementation of policy, we still were always stuck in either a conservative Keynesianism or a liberal Keynesianism, but never a non-Keynesian macro framework. And Menke admits this as much. Because Bob Lucas didn't go to Washington, D.C., right? You know, John Cochran didn't go to Washington, D.C. Eugene Fama didn't go to Washington, D.C. But Menke did. But Menke did. Where does he teach at? <laughs> right? He's part of that, and he's a New Keynesian. He never said he was a, was a uh, Chicago guy, right? So it's a very eye-opening thing, because the construction of the narrative started all the way back in 2007, right? Wild regulations. I did a, a, a little booklet called the house that Uncle Sam built. It's about the housing crisis. And one of the things that we do in there, I'm not saying that you should believe it. You know, I recommend, again, invitation to inquiry. Go read it. Right? You can get it for free from fee. Okay? So go read it and look at it. But one of the things that I'd like you to pay attention to and talk to me about, if you have counter evidence, is that the number of regulations. So a lot of claim has been the reason why we went uh, to hell in a handbasket is because we had this massive amount of deregulation. Well, the financial industry is one of the most regulated industries in the United States. Take a good look at the number of regulations that took place during the so-called period of deregulation versus the number of regulations that were suspended. Okay, here's the list of new regulations. Here's the list of suspensions. Okay? So how can you tell me this is a period of wild cap capitalism gone crazy and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But that's what the narrative constructed. So again, you know, think about that. What it leads us to is a much more humble position. The economist cannot direct the economy. All that can be done is we set up the institutions and the rules of the game, and then the system has to work its way out. Right? The recession is the correction. So when unemployment rates go, well, what's going on? Markets are recalibrating. They're reestablishing things. What have we done? We've tried to constantly forestall the correction for short-term relief, and what we've done is sacrifice long-term growth. Right? So what we've done since 2008 is exactly, in my opinion, the wrong way to approach this. And it's the reason why you guys have such dim uh, employment prospects. All right? If you want to figure out what's wrong with your labor market, read the, uh, the uh, book by, um, it's called The Recession, the, uh, the redistribution recession, Casey Mulligan, Chicago labor economist, right? The redistribution recession. What we've done is we've, in the midst of this lack of demand for hiring, we've raised the cost of hiring people. When you raise the cost of hiring people, we don't hire them, okay? That's why you have dim labor prospects. You should be very, very angry. Just like I was in the late 1970s when I was coming out of high school and then going to college. Unemployment, the employment prospects, <clears throat> when I went off to college, were very bad for college kids, too. It was called the stagflation of the 1970s. It wasn't a good time to get a job. All right, so the relevance. Here we go. Why study all this stuff? <clears throat> because Adam Smith speaks to us today. He really does. I'm, <coughs> I'm showing you right now. Okay, Adam Smith, in the fifth book of The Wealth of Nations, talks about the way that you would frame public policy. And he refers to the issue of juggling tricks. The juggling tricks of government, ancient as well as modern. The juggling tricks as follows. Governments run deficits. That leads to accumulated public debt, which then they try to pay off by inflating the currency. OK? Anyone who studied the history of public finance will recognize this pattern, right? When you have hyperinflations, actually, uh, it's a, this is a, a very uh, kind of cool thing. When I was at Hoover, they mentioned before, Tom Sargent was there, and, and, we, and we had the Sargent gave a talk, and one of the talks that he said was, we have to uh, modify Friedman's dictum. Friedman's dictum was inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Okay? He says, we have to modify it slightly. He says, hyperinflations are everywhere and always preceded by fiscal imbalances. So whenever you look at a, a position of a hyperinflation system, it's because they embrace the juggling trick of Adam Smith. So think about it. Adam Smith, there's two ways to respond to Adam Smith's point about the juggling trick. One of them is to say, hey, let's stop the jugglers. Now the question is, what do you do? You tie the jugglers' hands behind their back, right? That's like a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. 
but they still might flip around or make <laughs> pretend that it's invisible. Or what you could do is chop the drug lord's arms off. Right? That's Hayek's argument for denationalization of money. Let's take money out of the hands of government because we can't trust government to be bound by rules. Friedman basically said the same thing when he wanted to put money in the hands of a computer rather than in the hands of individuals, right? So what we, what we think about here, but the other way is a Keynesian way, which is let's try to be master jugglers, right? That's Bernanke, right? Bernanke says, if you watch his 60 Minutes interview, he's asked the question, he says, are you worried about inflation? He goes, if inflation starts, I can stop it just like that. That's a direct quote. It's a massive amount of hubris. Now, why does he believe he can do that? Because he can flood the economy in cash, but he can suck up the excess reserves with a vacuum cleaner. By the way, he has been, in some sense, sucking up the excess, like the reserves, and some of this because he's paying the banks to hold on to the reserves. So the reserves haven't been thrown into the economy. By the way, nothing that Bernanke, Bernanke let me be clear about something. Bernanke was the most qualified academic from his side of the fence to head the position that he did. And everything that he has done since he's been in, in power, since the financial crisis, is consistent with his own academic theories. If you read his 1983 paper on the credit transmission mechanism during the Great Depression, what he did in 2008 and since is identical to what he would have advised then. So it's not, there's, it's, and Bernanke in some sense, for sake of argument I'm gonna claim, violates all public choice principles. He's actually truly like doing like what he thinks is the right thing to do given the circumstance. I just disagree with his recipe. But it's not like he is, he's unknown or uncharted territory. They always claim it's uncharted territory. It's not uncharted. It was called the 1960s and we had the Vietnam War and we had a lot of problems like that and Arthur Burns was in control. And what did Arthur Burns did? He did a first version of Operation Twist. Why? Because when I try to flood an economy with cash to do the the, uh, check, the, uh, the juggling trick, what do the people in the economy do? Okay? They actually start to respond to their expectations that inflation is coming. And they hedge against inflation. What's one of the things that you see with hedges of inflation? Long-term interest rates going up. Okay? So what do I want to do if I want to not have that signal countering the force of my flooding the economy with cash? So that's why I spend 85 billion a month, right, and buying the bonds to try to push those things down, right? So QE3 and Operation Twist or QE whatever and all that. So, you know, this is, this is Adam Smith's juggling trick. What we've been doing is exactly what Adam Smith refers to as a juggling trick. And we are engaged massively in the juggle. All right, second thing is mainline economists have always been about savings, not about spending. Right? You want to make an economy operate, give people high-powered incentives to save. That provides the savings of some become investment funds for others. That's how you make an economy grow. Okay? Non-mainline economists focus on the spending. Right? Let's get them to consume. Let's buy, 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 buy. It's all about consumption. All right? So the economy is driven by consumption, not by savings. All right? And so this is where you get the aggregate demand stuff and everything. So this debate over the nature of the multiplier, which you've lived through, your entire adult academic life in economics has been one long debate about the multiplier. Right? That's what's going on. Read the papers. Right? The stimulus, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? How does it work? Well, it works if what? If the multiplier is enough to turn the $10 here into $100 over there. It doesn't work if there's crowding out. $10 here means that $10 doesn't get invested there. So you've lived through this debate, which is the mainline debate. It was a debate that took place with the classical economists. It's a debate that took place between Keynes and Hayek. And it's a debate today that's taking place you know, in your lifetime. And then finally, the importance of free trade and development, immigration policy. The greatest policy that hasn't been tried yet to solve world poverty is immigration. Right? You care about global justice? Let people come here. Right? Open the doors. Right? Now, what's the downside of all of that? Right? What's the only downside? It's not that people can't do jobs and things like that. It's the downside if they have claims to like the welfare state and things like that. Okay? But other than that, you know, the argument for allowing the free mobility of labor and capital is the oldest argument in economics. All right? That's part of the way in which John Stuart Mill had the following quote. He said, one of the most mysteries 
of human life is the great rapidity with which countries bounce back from disaster, either man-made or natural. But what's the condition under which countries can bounce back very quickly? Free mobility of, la of labor and capital. I was a principal investigator on a Katrina project. We went in right after Katrina happened. We, what we want to do is study longitudinally for five years how it is that they tried to bounce back after that. Okay? So I'm a kid from New Jersey. All right? Uh, most of when I graduated high school, everyone in my town either went into three, three occupations. They either you know, went to the police, <coughs> military, right? or they went to work for factories in the union, or they might have went to college. But it wasn't like everyone went to college. It was divided up into those areas. Okay? And, uh, but, so I know a lot of guys that were in unions and stuff like that. Here's what normally would happen. Hurricane Andrew would hit Florida. Tony from you know, Newark would head down to, to Florida. Why? Because over the winter months, right after the hurricane hit, he could make $50,000 by banging in you know, hammers and, or being an electrician or whatever. So what did that require? Think about what that requires. It requires that the state of Florida recognize Tony's license that he earned in New Jersey to be able to do the things that he did. What did Louisiana do? You want to know why Louisiana took a long time? Think through this. Occupational licensing in Louisiana. Here's what they did, OK? Not a license to remove debris. So what happened? Debris got pushed up onto the side. Licenses required to rebuild. But here's what the rub is. In order to have your license from New Jersey recognized in Louisiana, you had to live in Louisiana for six months without working. Because we have to protect Louisiana electricians from unfair competition from those rascals, Tony. Okay? So who's going to go down there? Is Tony going to go down there? No. He's going to stay you know, right here, right? So what happens is that New Orleans didn't get rebuilt because there was not a free, free mobility of labor and capital. So New Orleans lang languished. There's other reasons. You know, if you build people at the bottom of a soup bowl, then you fill the soup bowl up and you pay them to build back on the bottom of the soup bowl, they're going to keep doing that, right? That's homo soup bowl anomalous, right? <laughs> so they're going to, you know, they're going to keep doing stuff like that, which is silly to do, but that's what we do in our things. They also, because of that, they didn't devised the floodplain, uh, the, the revised floodplain fast enough. There was all kinds of uncertainty associated with what's going on. FEMA, you know, kept on upping their benefits even though they're not working. Again, if you graduate from college next, this year, and then you have a choice. I could work for $10,000, or I could sit on my butt and master video games for $9,000. $9,000 looks pretty good, right? Right, on the margin, right? You're gonna sit there, it's like, okay, you're all sitting there saying, yeah, that me. I'm from Hillsdale, right? I have virtue, right? But I'm, you know, the normal kid, you know, they're, they're gonna sit there and they're gonna say, on the margin, I'm gonna go like this. So what we have here is free trade, globalization, all of these sort of debates, again, relate back to classical economies. All right, last, last slide. I want you to study economics, okay? Why should you study economics? First, it's the most entertaining subject you'll ever come across in the social sciences, all right? No other social science can write about the economics of pirates, okay? <laughs> we can tell you about how the pirates maximize their booty, okay? <laughs> right? Economics gives us that. Um, it, it, uh, if you read a book like Freakonomics, we can explain all kinds of different phenomena under a hidden order by David Friedman, all kinds of things out the window. The big important thing is to remember is that economics is a set of eyeglasses. The point is not to gaze at the blackboard, but to look out the window. The world is so fascinating outside of, you, outside of us. There's so many cool things that are going on every day, and all you need to do is be able to have an economic set of eyeglasses to make sense of that not just stare in the blackboard. The blackboard is a tool for your reasoning, the purpose of which is to help you understand the world out there. And it's amazing, the world is an amazing thing. It's also the most important subject. Literally, it's a subject dealing with the life and death of billions of people. And so not only are you having fun, but you're really saving or understanding how you can address this issue of the biggest issues that face our society. Uh, and in that regard, I think, you know, economics is just, it's an invitation to all of you, and it is the golden key. So, it's a great line from Hayek, and I'm going to end with this. Hayek 
has a line, he says, nobody can be as dangerous as an economist who's only an economist. We agree with that, right? But I also have a caveat to that, or a proviso, whatever the right phrase is. And it says, nobody's as dangerous as an economist who only knows economics, except a philosopher who doesn't know any economics at all, okay? <laughs> so what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're constantly engaging in this social dialogue over the nature of, of uh, and causes of good societies, okay? And economics is an essential component to that conversation. And what I try to do in Living Economics is invite you to that conversation and encourage you to join uh, that conversation. I know many of you will choose to do that for your vocation. So thank you very much. Uh,